Welcome to today's webinar, which comes to you from the Fellowship of Postgraduate Medicine, publisher of the journals Postgraduate Medical Journal and Health Policy and Technology. Today's session concerns what to do about medical burnout. I am Donald Singer, Chair of the FPM. My fellow panelists are Caroline Elton, Dr. John Lorner, and Dr. Antonis Kuzulis as well as Professor Bernard Chung, Editor-in-Chief of the Postgraduate Medical Journal. Our presenters today have all published in the June issue of the Postgraduate Medical Journal on burnout. They are Mark Abrahams from the USA, Leomar Delfini from St. George's, London, Dr. Craig Ferguson from Alberta, currently a fellow in San Francisco, and Dr. Jayasakthi Sanyasiya from Malaysia and Dr. Jennifer Taylor from the University of Sydney. We shall start with a survey reported by Dr. Craig Ferguson amongst residents in the state of Alberta in Canada. I'm delighted to have Craig Ferguson with us. Uh, Craig is speaking to us from San Francisco. Would you say what inspired you to think about doing this study? We had a lecture in a couple of years ago about burnout and, and hadn't really been talked too much about before that. And I started thinking about it myself and I was in kind of peak call. I was doing a lot of overnight work and I was feeling pretty, you know, burnt out myself. So I started looking into it and I said, I, I pretty much think I satisfy most of these criteria. Um, so, I was like, so then that kind of caused me to start thinking of other people and I started talking to colleagues and they felt the same. So then I decided it'd be probably a good idea to do a big survey and assess to see how much burnout there is and see if there's a way we can fix it. Um, it's obviously a very multifactorial issue, but um, trying to find solutions, and at least in Alberta, was, was a priority for me. How did you go about recruiting people to respond to your survey? So I um, basically had uh, the PGME, so the Postgraduate Medical Education Office, send out, survey, send out the survey to every single resident in Alberta. So Alberta has two universities, University of Alberta and University of Calgary, um, with a total population of about, um, I think, 1,700 uh, residents, so fair-sized population. Uh, we had it sent out then, and we also had it sent out by individual program administrators. So the program minister of radiology at the University of Alberta, the program administrator of nephrology at each school. So basically every school had it sent out. Um, and we also had a reminder by our uh, professional association of residents. It um, was also sent a reminder, and they sent it to everyone. So we had lots of ways to send it out to everyone. And we had uh, incentives such as uh, gift cards um, to Starbucks. So uh, that enticed people to come. And that's why we were able to get, I think, a 40 one percent um, response rate, which is for a survey that was probably twenty-five minutes long. Yeah, it's pretty pretty good for people to just fill it out. I think. Very nice. Did you have any sense of reluctance from some people to reply? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, we had uh, I had a few colleagues actually contact me directly about that, uh, but I assured them that, and we stated in our kind of um, preamble to the survey that every every uh, I'll be the only one looking at this data. It'll be anonymized right away. It'll be assigned a number and that it will never be going back to the individual programs themselves with the data um, so that they could identify, um, you know, ages and then you can see that sex and you can eventually get back to the, 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 kind of the, the resident that responded. So um, we haven't had any issues with that yet. And I was the only one that really looked at the data, the, the raw data. And then um, our statistician just got a bunch of numbers and I sent it to him. So I don't think he was able to get back to them. And would you run through the high-level results from your survey? Yeah, of course. So uh, we we define burnout by many major studies have defined burnout as having high emotional exhaustion and or high depersonalization. They kind of take away the personal achievement component of the burnout syndrome when they look at burnout. And we had 69% burnout rate, which is super high um, across uh, multiple specialties. And it didn't really matter what specialty you were in. Um, so, uh, you know, some has slightly higher, but nothing really statistically significant. Uh, like some specialty surgeries, like orthopedics and neurosurgery, some has slightly higher than uh, specialties such as pediatrics. But nothing significantly that was the data, like that had a p value less than 0 0.05. Um, so it does show that every specialty has their own stressors and every specialty has their own burnout rates. 
irrespective of how people perceive that certain specialties can be harder or easier than other ones. So it seems like that was not an issue at all. We found burnout really associated with things like higher work hours, uh, more call, um, less time off, uh, being unhappy in your residency program, being unhappy with your career choice you've chosen. Um, so it's kind of things that most people would think that burnout could be associated with. Um, we found that uh, there was no real difference between the universities, no real difference between you know, rural versus urban programs. Um, but we, one thing we did find strongly was that there was a lot of harassment and intimidation happening across Alberta. We had over 50% of residents reporting they had some sort of harassment or intimidation experience to them. And we had examples, written examples that were quite horrific at times to read. Um, and with 50% strongly associated with burnout, of course, and, uh, and that was quite shocking to us that it was that high. Um, and then uh, the big thing that we wanted to look at was what solutions to burnout there were. Um, an interesting thing is that we, we posted a bunch of options for solutions to burnout, um, including better teaching, better lounge access, better food on call, all this kind of stuff. And people didn't really care that much about those, those stuff. It, the teaching was one thing that they did think that better teaching would definitely improve their life. But the mo they, a lot of people just filled in blanks saying that they think that the culture of medicine is the big issue with burnout, that they feel that, um, you know, back in my day, they blank or, you know, that they feel like the culture of medicine needs to change in order to improve burnout. They also found that a big issue was um, having lack of time off, lack of flex days so you could go to a dental appointment or you need a wellness to just to relax and take time off. They said there's very little flexibility for that kind of stuff. And that was a huge driver of burnout to a lot of uh, residents. Um, and then, of course, call hours. But that's something that is in Canada, we kind of limit you at um, a 26 hour shift maximum every four days. Um, um, but even that, it, it seems like it's just hard on a lot of people and a lot of specialties don't really abide by that rule. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's five years. Uh, you just do typically a one extra year fellowship. Most people do that, so six years there. But yeah, it, was, uh, it wasn't really dependent on the stage of training. We, we looked at most every year and saw if there's any significant difference. There wasn't really. There looked like there may be a trend to um, kind of earlier and later, which would make sense, I guess, if earlier you're new to the specialty and you're trying to learn the ropes and you're doing a lot of call shifts and later you're studying for your board exams and stuff and it's quite stressful that way and causing you to burn out that way. But there was nothing really significant between the year of training. And, and the other obvious thing is thinking about, I suppose, gender and family. What about male versus female? Also, what about having responsibilities at home as additional, additional stress of having children, for example? Yeah, yeah, we looked at that as well. And, uh, sex made no real difference, uh, no significant difference, and uh, same as age didn't make a significant difference. And uh, having family at home and uh, um, and having children and having responsibilities at home didn't really make a difference either. There's no significant difference between them. Um, certain people had said that um, certain social supports do increase their stress level or decrease their stress level, um, but it was nothing really that significant. And before. So very, very interesting survey there from, from Craig that we went into many more details, but I think it'd be useful at this stage perhaps to take some reflections from our, our panel and then from, from the, the delegates. I should say that um, in, in further questioning, Craig did point out that uh, he'd raised this with the authorities and tried to make them aware of it, and, and they did express uh, concern and interest, but so far there hasn't been any, any specific action to try to resolve matters. Um, any thoughts from, from your perspective, either Antonis or John or, or Caroline? I think that the, the point that Craig made about the culture is really important. And Donald, as we discussed on the phone last week, I think that what we're beginning to see in the research literature and perhaps beginning to see, but it's patchy in, in various train organizations, for example, in the UK, like the GMC, is that there needs to be a, a fundamental shift away from burnout being seen as a lack of resilience to an understanding that burnout, that, that the root causes are systemic. So we could see it in terms of the culture, how work is organized. And we need to shift the re responsibility back away from the individuals. Of course, the individuals have to, uh, as professionals, need to act, uh, need to adhere to professional values. But essentially, we need to be looking at the organisational uh, correlates and the organisational responsibilities.
Uh, and John, any, any reflections at this stage? John Lohner? Just to unmute myself, I, um, I, I would completely like to endorse what, firstly, Craig's findings and secondly, what Caroline has said. I think we have to get away from this as seeing as a problem that's somehow situated within the individual and understand it as a multi-level problem. There may well be individual factors for certain people, but essentially we're looking at what is the level of educational support and supervision for an individual, how does the team function? And I think well-functioning teams are a very good protective factor in relation to burnout. What is the organizational culture? And particularly, how seriously does the leadership um, take bullying and harassment, which appear to be major factors right across the board for people who experience burnout? And, and then issues to do with national medical design and culture, including rotors and how those are structured, including uh, career progression and also career opportunities, including moving sideways if somebody finds themselves in an unsatisfactory situation. So these are, I mean, to use Caroline's words, these are systemic problems and they require systemic solutions. They require support for the individual like mentoring and coaching and psychological support and, and career support, um, good supervision and teaching and um, a healthy organizational culture, I mean, right up to the top. And often it's the chief executives or the leadership boards of the organizations that can make most difference in terms of the amount of burnout that's happening for the individuals. Can I move on now to Dr. Antonis Gazoulis, who, who is director of the England and Wales Mental Health Foundation. Uh, from your perspective, Antonis, what are your thoughts on what we've heard so far? Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I agree with all, with all that. And I think some of the, if you look at some of the um, research that um, some of the classic research that has, has been done in, in mental health and stress, um, it's, not, it's not in the medical or healthcare um, kind of space, but there is a lot to learn. Um, we seem to still have a legacy of this response of a senior person, you know, when a colleague says, I'm stressed, having that response, or oh, you're stressed, you know, you should, you should see how stressed I am. Um, and, and this has brought, you know, that kind of toxic legacy of, of how seniors are, are managing uh, stuff that are more junior. But the classic research shows that it's the opposite. You know, people that are more stressed are the ones that have a lot of demands on them and very little control over these demands, which, which points much more to, you know, as my colleagues have said, you know, systemic kind of roots of, the, of um, stress and burnout in a workplace setting. And, and do, you, do you see an, any contrast between the Canadian experience and, and UK or, or elsewhere? Uh, I mean, I, I, th I think it's quite similar. Um, I think we've, we've kind of built um, environments in which there are, there are so many demands and expectations um, in terms of hours, in terms of uh, tasks, in terms of uh, sort of care um, without uh, a lot of factoring in of things like compassion fatigue or um, lack of sleep and things like that. Um, and it's quite similar across different um, countries and, and different as far as, are, as far as I'm aware. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, we, we have um, with us um, a medical student from St. George's, uh, Luama Dolfini. And I should say that our contributors one common link is that they have all published recently in the Postgraduate Medical Journal, an issue put together by uh, Bernard Chung, the editor, um, with an editorial by John Lorner. So, Luomar, would, would you, would you um, let us know what your thoughts were? Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Um, I definitely agree with everything that's been said so far, and obviously my experience as a medical student is very limited. But um, what I've found as a medical student is um, a lack of mentorship between different generations within medicine per se. So for example, um, students who are coming into medical school and then kind of final years and then foundation year doctors with final years and then trainees with foundation doctors and so forth. And I think this lack of mentorship um, definitely contributes to this Kind of environment within medicine where people aren't very open about their struggles and about the stress that they're going through um so that is something that i'd like to see changed within the medical curri curriculum and um, our education as well 
As a very specific point, I was at St George's some years ago, and when I was there, I was aware that there was an attempt to try to do something along those lines with the, the so-called daughter, mother, grandmother, or grandfather system. So at least there would be some sort of across the medical school from the, the, the new students through to the more senior to try to get some kind of support. The risk, of course, there is is that perhaps the people who most need support may not not be. Uh, brave enough or, or uh, to, to come forward. What, is that still happening with you and has, has that been helpful as far as you're aware? So we still have that um, and it is great in the way you do make connections, you do network. Um, however, it's not something that's compulsory, it's not explicitly within the me medical curriculum and also um, it's become more of a social um, thing rather than an educational thing which would help students actually open up about their struggles. Mm. So maybe um, looking at how we can uh, repackage that scheme would be interesting. Thank you. And what, what you also pointed out, of course, is what about reaching through to foundation doctors and beyond to the students? And the trouble with that, of course, is, is a practicality of making the links. But nonetheless, I think it's a very good suggestion to, to try to make that work somehow. I, um, do we have any, any, if there are any questions from our audience? Do please use the chat button or the raise the hand button. Um, Carolyn? Just very briefly, I'd like to say, I think one key difference between the UK and other systems is the amount of movement. I, my understanding is in Canada and also in, uh, certainly for the U US and the system, I, I know relatively well, I'm not so sure about Canada, is that the, the frequency of movement is much, much less. And I think that that was something that came out in the recent GMC survey as well and needs to be really thought about. A foundation, you'll have three, you know, three positions in your first year and sometimes that four month block is two is actually two times two months so th throughout extended training there's a huge amount of moving around diff to different hospitals and different communities. thank you Karen it's a very important point and and that that for the UK geography is is very, very difficult to tra yeah. travel say from north of Scotland to the deep south is not so easy and, and certainly splitting up families I, I was surprised that Craig Ferguson commented that family um, and family family busyness, if you like, didn't seem to feature. You just thought that might do, but certainly if, if you're forced to move and you've got two people trying to work and two people in medicine trying to work, that, that, that can be extremely difficult, I would think. At this stage, I think it might be interesting to, to move on now to some examples of, of attempts to, to address, at least at, at a regional level, um, by providing some sort of support. What I want to do now is to share with you a video recording uh, I uh, did last week with Dr. Jen Taylor, who just completed a PhD at the University of Sydney, looking at, uh, in her case, a short intervention. And as background, because of awareness of burnout and, and uh, general issues reported back from medical staff, but in particular, a number of suicides recently, um, that there has been a systematic provision of support. Now, the decision has been to do two things. One, as Carolyn may say more about it, board level to have somebody appointed as a welfare officer. But secondly, um, to provide availability of somebody as, as a, as a counsellor through mindfulness and yoga and other support. So anybody who works in the Sydney area is able to access this. The question, of course, is, is that any good? Is that better than just having a friend or, or having some time out. So what Jen has done is carried out a study which was published in the Pushcart Medical Journal recently. And I'll now just uh, let her tell you what, what she did and what the findings were. Just one moment while I share the screen again. Um, a pilot of yoga, personalised yoga, compared to group exercise or group fitness training. So it was a very small pilot. We were just dealing with a single hospital, the Royal uh, Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney. 
Uh, so what, that's what you see here. 11 were randomized to personalized yoga, 10 to group exercise. We had um, uh, one early withdrawal on the yoga side for medical reasons and two on the group exercise side for work and study reasons predominantly. This sample um, was um, disproportionately female, it was 76% female, but it was actually quite proportionately represented in terms of the type of junior doctor roles that were involved. We had registrars, interns and residents, predominantly registrars. Interventions reduced burnout. And I think this is something that, um, that was really nice to see uh, in the quantitative data. We only dealt with an eight week intervention here. So we're really only dealing with eight hours of intervention. Now on the yoga arm, we, we did also offer a four hour optional retreat on a weekend that half of the participants attended or six of the participants attended. Um, so there was a, a little bit more offered in the yoga arm, but we are really only dealing with eight weeks here. So the results are, are reflecting uh, that data. And this is only, I remind you, arm one. So the, the, the 10 and 8 that completed arm um, 1. So we saw compassion satisfaction increase within groups, certainly within personalised yoga, but quite importantly on the MASAC burnout inventory, which is um, a common measure of burnout, we saw a, a, a big shift in depersonalisation in particular. And now you might expect that of a personalised intervention that depersonalization would be addressed but i think we we're also seeing a little bit of interaction here with the type of intervention so uh, the yoga intervention certainly incorporated it, physical postures but it also incorporated breath it incorporated meditation it also incorporated the potential for that that one-on-one -on -one therapeutic alliance to build up with the individual and some of that came out in the qualitative data separately and we also saw here, as you can see, um, in indicated by the arrows, the pers personal accomplishment also increased in, uh, in both groups, which was quite good. In terms of um, the trauma-specific outcomes, we didn't see uh, a large uplift. We didn't necessarily expect a significant pathology in, in this group, but um, we certainly had two reporting high-risk suicidal ideation at the baseline. Um, one improved significantly and another left the, uh, for work reasons, left the study. Um, we had two others that um, reported at different points in the study, reported clinical levels of a PTSD as well. But I actually um, also, yeah, would like to talk to this quote. Um, one participant, uh, this participant shared, uh, had came to a session and actually it was a 6 a.m. session and, and had been on a, on a late shift previously and had quite tragically lost a patient unexpectedly and was dealing with that particular work event and also um, dealing with the debrief and the various things, the appropriate processes that are in place for that support, but also she felt that that she gained a great deal by coming to the session the next day um, and and just having a physical uh, physical and emotional release in session and preparing herself and being able to get herself in an emotional state where she might then be able to walk into the brief debrief. So within our current our webinar, there's not time to go through all the points that Jen raised. But just just to add, um, she she did say that one thing that participants benefited from, they said, was the group and having a chance to meet people and share, and then the, the communal aspect of what was offered. But she also said that within what was found, exercise versus uh, yoga, it did appear that those who had um, the yoga sessions did seem to find them more helpful um, so, so within group activities something about that for, for that particular group appeared to be um, of, of greater benefit for them the next the other comment of course is if you were to do this the, the cost to the system the cost of providing exercise and exercise training and things you could do and as a group on your own is much less than it would be for uh, a trained yoga specialist to be able to do this and so Jen's next step is, to, with the help of, of Beth Warner, who is the chief welfare officer, is to, is to seek funds to have a much larger scale study to see what is, um, would happen in, in more people, um, but also um, to look at 
what would be affordable and feasible in, 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 in practice, because this was really pretty, pretty intensive. And the question is, what can you do that's, that's self-directed and what can you do that really needs that sort of group support? So with, with that um, background and having heard Jen, it, any comments or questions in relation to, to this particular study or experience in Sydney? Sometimes, some, sometimes what happens though, and I've heard this when initiatives can be uh, being organised, is that the, just precisely those staff who, who would most benefit don't have the time to get to them. And that, that again is another reason why it's very important if these initiatives can have high level support. Um, and although this is a, um, concentrating on postgraduate medicine, I think that it, it is important to acknowledge that the issue of, of whether one can actually get to any of these interventions is even more acute when one get, looks at, uh, let's say, nursing, nursing colleagues. Mm. It's an important practical point, Carolyn. I mean, just to add what Jen said, to try to make things as easy as possible, these sessions were delivered on site. Um, yeah, either yeah. beginning or end of the day but again if you've got family responsibilities <laughs> if you end of a very tough shift it's very difficult even with that to be able to get there or if you're if you're low staffed yes you yes. know you know whether somebody hasn't turned if you're if you're down somebody on the rotor it's quite difficult to be attending you know if you're so it, it needs to be signposted from on high mm. I have a question here which which relates I suppose in a way to the group support but also Luama's earlier point about about budding systems, can, can anybody comment about uh, formal mentorship schemes as opposed to the sort of grandfather daughter idea, which which is, is much looser, where where you you volunteer and people may may take part, and how are they supervised is really quite different from formal mentorship. Is that something you're aware of, Carolyn or John, in terms of practice in the UK or elsewhere, things that have worked well or haven't worked well? Well, I think John, John knows much more about the HE mentoring scheme, schemes, so I'll leave him to comment on that. But in the chat, I did just briefly put um, this I know in a personal capacity, because my son is at Warwick, uh, just finishing the first, finish the first year. And at Warwick, they are the only med school where you can go with non science, with no sciences, and not have to sit the GAMSAT. So essentially, you can go with the Australian uh, uh, graduate entry exam. So you, he had done no formal science. Um, and wasn't required to as part of the entry process since 16 and he was 30 and they had previously found quite a high rate of failure of their non-science um, entrance and the, the what they then did was that the the non-scientists from year two have have supported the non-science of year one and this is not this is not an eight-week scheme this is a, a support pretty much five days a week after classes. And it's had an amazing effect, both academically, in terms of reducing the problem of the non-scientists, and they now, they now do very well. And also in terms, I think, of the uh, psychologically, because they don't feel so pressured. So that's, and, and, and apparently that, that my son has told me that they've been studying that as well. They've actually written it up formally because they've got a department of medical education. So I think it shows really, you know, an innovative scheme can have an incredible effect. But John knows much more about the, the London Deanery mentoring. Yeah. Could, could I add to that, Caroline, by making a distinction between um, internal mentor, mentorship schemes of the yeah. kind of yeah. and external yeah. mentorship schemes where an yeah. organisation like Health Education England makes yeah. mentors available, independent mentors who are out from outside the individual's organisation for a series of, let's say, six or eight yeah. uh, mentorship sessions. Where we have done that, it's been tremendously successful in terms of the effects on the clients. Um, but then you have to question, are we actually accessing the right people or are the right people accessing us in those, those that are most needy through, through a kind of inverse care law, maybe getting the least. And that's where I think internal uh, mentorship schemes of the kind that Lua Mara referred to earlier and Caroline has just spoken about are, are, are probably better at, at actually reaching the people with the greatest needs. Uh, Mark Abrams, can, can you comment on mentoring from a US perspective? Yeah, I can. Um, and it's one of the things that I'll sort of get to um, when I give my portion of the, the presentation. But I think very commonly in medical school, there's a, a large push to have assigned mentors, um, more or less through the dean's office. And those people function as 
key faculty advisors that help people navigate their, uh, their residency application process and what they're going to do after they graduate from medical school. In, um, in the postgraduate training, I think it's a little bit uh, of a, a two-pronged approach. One is a formal approach where you do have um, faculty advisors that most often come through people interested in research. Um, but there's also this idea of peer mentorship, which is pretty informal, but often happens without any, any programs in place, where people will turn to you know, their, their more senior trainees, um, people have, uh, who have graduated and gone off to, to careers and in their early career phase. And those people offer a lot of, um, a lot of mentorship. Um, but certainly it becomes more disparate the farther along you get, um, particularly for those people not involved in the research world. Can I, uh, I don't know how to raise my hand, Donald, so uh, can I come Fine, in? Fine, if you do go ahead, go ahead, Wade, yes. Uh, further, further to what Caroline was saying, uh, at, at Warwick Medical School, they have a, a strict tutorship or mentorship uh, program, which is called the Clinical Personal Tutors, on which in a number of senior clinicians or all clinicians uh, are assigned a group of students uh, to look after them in their pastoral role. In other words, it's not an educational role. It's, um, it's just looking after their welfare, making sure they're making good progress, they're not stressed out. Um, and uh, I, I agree that only recently, in the last two years or so, uh, the medical school, in, in their wisdom, uh, decided to admit non-science um, previous degrees. And uh, although they're, because they have a different perspective to life rather than sciences, I think they should do better, but they do struggle a bit in a, in a medical or scientific environment. And I personally, I'm, I'm, I'm a clinical personal tutor and I have a group of seven or eight students that I look after and uh, they invariably, at least that's, that's what they say to me, they find it really quite useful to have a designated uh, person to go to if they're in difficulties. Thank you very much, Wade. Can we move now to Hong Kong to Bernard Chung? Would you like to comment, Bernard? Uh, well, yes. Um, uh, well, first of all, um, the rate of uh, burnout is actually um, astonishingly high amongst um, junior doctors uh, and actually senior doctors and medical students alike. Although you would have thought, you know, gosh, I mean, it's a little bit too early to, you know, to have burnout when you're only a year three or year four medical student that happens. And the sad truth is that uh, uh, there was a survey in Hong Kong of junior doctors um, or oh, junior and not so junior doctors, and, and the rates uh, uh, of burnout were just as high as uh, the, the ones um, mentioned just now. Um, <coughs> second point I want to comment is about yoga. Uh, we, we actually had, until recently, a weekly, or perhaps even twice weekly, yoga um, class um, after work at about you know half five or something like that and everybody had to bring their own mats and all that. And it was run without any, you know, resources. It was just, you know, a member of staff who was very much into it and, and, and willing to kind of, you know, lead. So we, we had the, the, the place uh, for free and, and, and there, there we go. I, I didn't join any of the classes. But uh, it, you know, it's, it's on the ground floor of the medical school and, uh, and, and quite a few, you know, people went and it was all free and, uh, and, and you know, and, and no resource implications. Um, now the third, my third comment is about mentoring. Um, it's very much ad hoc uh, in my medical school. Uh, this afternoon we had a meeting discussing problematic students and I actually have to mentor a, uh, a, a you know particularly uh, um, uh, difficult you know really struggling student so it's very ad hoc um, uh, having said that I'm actually you know quite good at it mainly because you know I think 
um, the, the, so, the so-called burnout cases are much easier to handle than many of our patients. So, um, and, and after all, you know, uh, university students are very intelligent people. So, um, so yes, but, but unfortunately it's, it's rather ad hoc. Thank you very much, Bernard. Can we go now to back to USA to Claire Wilmot? Thank you. Um, so I just, I went to medical school in 1972 and we never had any interviews and I was given um, a pathologist as a mentor um, and he was a crazy man fascinating had the first electrical house in the neighborhood we used to go and have parties at his house which were sort of you know you had to be of a genre to enjoy his type of mentoring um he was nice but i would never take my personal problems to him i would never have taken any medical questions to him unless they pertain to something i knew a little bit about um, so I think ma matching mentors is an art. Uh, when I finished my medical school, I went straight to the US and went and did my internship in Boston. And I went to the Catholic system. And although I had a lot of trouble, it was during the time of National Organization of Women. And they insisted on having every residency internship had to have at least one female so i did surgery and i was the token female and you know what i realized it was i was white i spoke english and that was a real stress for our group um, we had two white americans and the rest were uh, people from other cultures countries and we became quite a cohesive group, but then they split us all up after the first, after the second year. Um, and it was down to three. And I happened to be one of the three. Um, mentorship has to match. You can't just be given someone. Um, and, you know, talking to all the people about how they went into practice, it didn't match always with culture or family style or, you know, politics. It, it's very difficult. Um, I became permanent friends with uh, an Argentinian <laughs> who um, went to become a urologist. I picked up friendships again with people who became surgeon, who became um, orthopedic surgeons, but I really haven't kept up well, except with the women in general surgery. So it's, you know, either we're difficult or we're difficult to match with a mentor. And, you know, when I joined the Association of Women Surgeons, whenever it started, I worked in the rural thing and it was really directed against academic women to try and get them into professorships. And I had one or two people I would talk to um, but I, my big mentor all my life in surgery turned, turned out to be um, an incredibly busy, older surgeon who died in his middle 90s. His wife was about the same, but he gave me more support and questioned about, you know, how to do a hernia and all that sort of thing. From a time that I had a major issue in um, whether I, could, I had to move and whether my cases in the first hospital would actually count towards my fellowship. And I actually went and sought him out. And after that, he was just right beside me. So, so Claire, it has to match. You raise a very important question. That's about how you get the right sort of dating, if you like, with the right mentor formal informal that's going to be really I have helpful. no idea except that, that, that's a huge challenge I think uh, Ro Roshni you have an experience uh, of alumni schemes would you like to comment on that oh yes thanks um yeah so I I studied at St Mary's and we had a so it was 96 91 to 96 and we had a buddying system and yeah I'm just interested in that just 
some people have mentioned the buddying system, sort of someone in year two um, sort of supported us, and that was a long time ago. But yeah, quite different to a mentoring scheme, which is why I was quite interested in that, thanks for the links that people have sent. Imperial have a matching scheme, so they do, they do have a matching scheme, so I'm not quite sure how they match. I've only mentored three students, so I'm not doing it this year at the moment, but I've, I've done that before. And that's, you know, meeting with the students, um, they're year one and two students. I think there's preference for students that wouldn't normally, you know, maybe widening particip participation, but it wasn't just medical school, it was alumni from all different sectors, so science, engineering, business as well. So it's quite interesting to meet, you know, colleagues or people from other, um, who are qualified in other fields as well. Um, and um, yeah, and the first event was a little bit like a date, like a speed dating thing. So you meet your mentor, you find or your mentee and you find your mentee and then you have regular meetings. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know what the evidence base is. It just makes me think, come to this talk, what the evidence base is, what, you know, apart from careers advice and sort of, I think what we've got to give us some, some people that are more senior rather than near peer mentoring and something formal is regular meetings, regular contact, you know, life experience as well as, you know, our professional experience. Sorry, I can't see you all now. Um, so sorry, that was a bit vague, but that was my experience of, of working with medical students and, and I guess, I mean, I don't practice clinically anymore, but as an educational supervisor, there was a specific role for you as an educational supervisor. So the last time I did that was nine years ago, um, but there was an element of mentoring in that. But again, does anyone have experience of what the outcome is from formal mentoring schemes? I guess some of that, those questions have been answered, you know, for different, you know, how does mentoring help if you're a medical student? Does it prevent burnout? Is there, is there hard and fast evidence for that? If we're talking about burnout, I suppose. That's really what I mean, if anyone has experience of that um, or studies or links. John, can you comment specifically on, on formal evidence of what works best in terms of mentoring um, for, for medical students? I, I'm, I'm, not aware, I, I'm, I'm not aware of outcome studies in terms of burnout, but that may simply be my ignorance. Um, but but I, I'm also aware, thinking of the wider uh, that sort of panorama of burnout that we also need to be thinking of other interventions, particularly interventions from leadership, because good as mentoring is, and I'm a huge advocate of it, um, it can sometimes be a bit like promoting resilience, that it does put the focus back on the individual, rather than looking, for example, at the onus on leadership boards to um, eradicate bullying or take bullying and harassment very seriously and make interventions at that level. It, it's not much good if you provide the best mentoring scheme in the world if it doesn't actually protect um, trainees or other staff from being bullied. Thank you, John. I, I've slightly, slightly sidestepped your question, but just wanting wanting to draw attention to other 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 ways of uh, you know remedying burnout. Just just to, to note, you may have seen this on the chat. Um, Kaji Yerav has asked, "What about references? What about the evidence, the formal published evidence?" Now, there is a special issue of the Postgraduate Medical Journal published in June this year. And the editors kindly said, if any of you have difficulty accessing the articles, and I will put links on our website, do, do please contact him. He'll make sure you, you, you can access those. But could I ask anybody on the call who's aware of references of interest that have not been mentioned so far, or the evidence, do please send me the, the links. I'll make sure they get added to our website. So at this stage, I'd like to go now to Malaysia, to Dr. Josakthi Sanyasia, um, who's going to talk about Schwartz rounds and coping with with medical burnout. Hi there, thank you for having me. Um, well, Schwartz Rounds, as we all know, is a group-based um, reflective practice. So um, it basically is a forum for clinical and non-clinical staff from um, all background and levels within a healthcare organization who comes together to explore the impact and uh, basically they express um, what they feel. So um, how I feel Schwartz Rounds would actually help is by sharing their own experience and hearing others do the same. The healthcare personnel or caregivers um, will gain more compassion for themselves and subsequently more energy and space to show compassion and empathy to patients. 
So um, in my department, for instance, we have a morning pass over whereby all staffs, both clinical and non-clinical, we sit together and discuss, um, well, initially we discuss the cases um, that came across, that we came across the day before. And then um, we would actually um, express what do we actually feel. And, um, you know, the base of this Schwartz rounds, um, as we know, is um, there is no hierarchy and um, all the participants are allowed to express their emotions without being judged. Thank you very much indeed. Any comments or questions on Schwartz rounds or can anybody who's used them in their own experience, their own practice, comment? Can I ask just a quick question? Do you have a facilitator? Um, well, in Malaysia, we don't exactly um, have a Schwartz rounds as a, a formal thing. We have um, um, we have a meeting. We call that a um, mortality and morbidity meeting. And right after that is when we share um, what we feel. So a facilitator, as per se, no. Uh, the person um, who's organizing the m, &M meeting would actually be um, the facilitator. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, this isn't, this isn't um, quite the same, but talking to one of the um, recent outgoing directors of Public Health England, they, they do have a regular um, check with all their staff on, on levels of burnout um, as, as a weekly bit of monitoring. Now, the question is, does that seem far too intrusive or too, too frequent? But clearly, if, if, if something pops up acutely, particularly at times of stress, then that, that may be, be helpful. And um, Karen, and this came up briefly, Schwarzstrands, when we talked last week. Do you want to add anything to what we've heard from Malaysia? Yes, I'm surprised in a way that there isn't a, a facilitator. And my, my, un, my understanding is in the UK, I think they would normally would be, um, in a way, kept differently from not just run on from an m, &M meeting. Um, but when I wrote my book, so I was doing this sort of research in about 2016, 17, there was, there, there had been useful studies on, on Schwartz rounds. So that was one form of intervention where there was starting to be some uh, relatively robust uh, uh, and encouraging data. So Mark Abrams, can, we're going to turn to you next for your paper in the PMJ, but can you, can you comment yourself on experience of Schwartz rounds from, from your perspective in the USA? Yeah, um, I know our hospital um, has been doing them for, for quite a while, and I can comment on that. I'm not sure how widely spread it is but um, throughout the country, but at our institution, we have um, a dedicated forum um, where everybody is invited, and there's usually uh, one facilitator um, who um, facilitates a panel of discussants who uh, usually come from social work, um, psychologists, and uh, medical doctors, um, and they pose different stories uh, based on whatever the topic is for that Schwartz rounds, be it you know dealing with end of life care or um, things like that. And someone will share a story and then the panel uh, and everyone invited will be able to ask questions and comment and share similar stories um, as sort of an open forum. Um, and it usually gets, um, you know, reasonably well attended with, I'd say, about 50 or so people in the audience and usually a few people on the panel. Thank you very much, Mark. Can we turn now to your, your paper in the PMJ, which I gather was on the Read SG program? Would it be helpful sure. if I share this, the screen to share the slides you sent me? That would be great, yeah. Just one moment then. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so the, I guess before I tell you about the, the details of the program, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me um, to talk about it. And second of all, it's really great hearing other people's stories from around the world, because some of these uh, common questions about, you know, what are the contributors and what do we do about it are exactly the questions I asked myself about seven years ago now. Um, before I started this program as an intern uh, in internal medicine. Um, and one of the, the key things that I noticed was that in the transition from my medical, medical school years 
to my residency years, um, there was this feeling of independence that I noticed, which I wasn't sure I, I really knew how to deal with. And I didn't know how to cope with a lot of those uh, emotions that it brought up and the new experiences I was seeing, which most people would uh, find very unnatural dealing with death and dying and you know, people at their most vulnerable points on a daily basis. Um, and I realized that my colleagues were also going through the same thing. And so not to, not to downplay that um, professional identity formation, but I almost saw it as an adolescence within, uh, within the profession of medicine. And um, you know, the way we all grew up and, and went through our teenage years, we all know that that's a very stressful, a very emotional time where we really need to learn how to be adults um, to function in society. And there are positive adaptive responses to, to those new experiences, and there are certainly maladaptive responses. And in conjunction with um, a program or kind of a top-down approach that allows you to, to create programs like the one that I did, um, I think that allowing peers, um, as opposed to faculty, uh, to help facilitate their own growth and development was something key that we wanted to study. So um, you could go to the next slide, please. So what we did um, is I thought about what I wanted to do in a program. And I looked at the research that existed uh, and I found a few things that really interested me. One was faculty facilitated small group sessions, which seemed to have success um, out of Colin West and Tate Shanafelt's group uh, in the Mayo Clinic, which in, um, in faculty, uh, seemed to have positive results in terms of mitigating burnout. And the other thing that I noticed was the approach of the balance style group where people share stories um, and reflect with one another seemed to be um, something that I was interested in studying more. And so what I developed uh, is a program that addressed what I thought was uh, a downside to other, other programs that had looked at um, burnout mitigation and burnout intervention techniques in trainees, which was that disconnect between the, you know, quote unquote, adolescent uh, within the group and the adult within the group, or better stated for our context, the trainee and the faculty. So to use a facilitator that truly understood the group, had shared experiences with the group, and that the, the participants would also feel comfortable um, speaking about their experiences with would be the optimum uh, way to do it. And so what I did is I developed a program which uh, is comprised of a committee, which at the time was just myself and a faculty mentor, uh, as well as facilitators who over the years have certainly grown in number. And in that we created a program that is self-sufficient, very low cost, uh, and also creates not only peer mentorship on the back end in terms of the, the committee learning uh, how to run groups and how to, how to promote this positive coping mechanism, but also the groups themselves, which benefits um, the entire uh, group of participants. And so what is the program? Well, READ SG stands for Reflect, Empathize, Analyze, and Discuss in Small Groups. And it starts with individual level reflection. And before each small group session, which happens um, about once monthly throughout the year in our internal medicine program here, um, participants are asked uh, to reflect on an individual prompt. And these prompts usually address something that's universal um, that everyone is going through, but maybe doesn't realize that, uh, that they're going through at the same time, such as conflicts between uh, trainees and faculty, conflicts between patient interests and your own interests, um, maybe dealing with end of life care, things that everybody has to learn how to deal with um, in going through the process of becoming a doctor and that professional identity formation. And once they've reflected individually, then they'll show up to the group and the facilitator um, who is trained by me and the other facilitators that have come before them, uh, basically share the prompt again and ask people to, to share their experiences. And in doing that, they really show empathy toward one another, listening to each other's stories um, and reacting to them. They start to realize that they're not alone. And then the facilitator will advance the discussion further uh, once um, there's been an appropriate level of sharing. Uh, 
to analyze those experiences. And this is really, um, you know, what I kind of think of as the secret sauce, which is allowing people to analyze each other uh, a little bit enough to realize that they can rely on each other um, for the emotional support they need. Um, they demonstrate peer support. They respond to each other and work through successes and challenges, not in a, a town hall manner where they're creating new policies and protocols, but in an emotional manner, manner where they're looking for um, support through their personal growth process. And as they discuss in the small groups throughout the year at each session, they create a community. Um, they really demonstrate a healthy mechanism of coping, uh, which replaces some of that, um, that absence of what do I do with all these new experiences that are stressful to me. And before and uh, at the end of each year, we administer the Maslach burnout inventory so that we can track people over time on an anonymous basis. Uh, and at each session, we give out a survey called the Read SG Study Survey, which asks them what they thought of the session with regards to uh, a few different measures, um, basically Likert scales on the effect of the session on their sense of professional development, empathy, stress, and motivation. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and here, sorry for the formatting change uh, here, but basically um, what we demonstrated, which is um, published in the paper as well, is that using a strict definition of burnout uh, with the Maslach burnout inventory, we found that people who attended more than three sessions uh, compared to people who attended none, since they're voluntary, um, did have decreased rates of burnout prevalence and incidence. Our overall numbers of burnout um, were not uh, significantly different from the trend that exists, which is, um, you know, about 20 uh, to 50% starting their intern year in medicine uh, with burnout, as defined by the Maslach burnout inventory, going up to 80% in the second and third years of training. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to demonstrate an effect on that, probably because of the relatively small numbers, but we would be interested in seeing on a larger scale uh, if that trend can be affected by this. What we were able to show though with odds ratios is that um, we had uh, decreased burnout prevalence and incidence. And then in the bottom right, you can see the Likert scales uh, of the PGY one, two, and three years from left to right in each graph of the effect of the session on uh, professional development, empathy, stress, and motivation. And with a score of about four out of five, meaning a positive uh, impact, people really like the programs and, and think that they're important to have. Um, interestingly, uh, at the beginning of when all this was starting, um, we surveyed people about what they thought about a peer facilitator or a near peer facilitator as opposed to faculty. And an overwhelming majority, about 80% preferred um, to have a peer to a faculty member. Not to say that that doesn't have its own role, which is you know, maybe important in other contexts, but this idea of having someone that is going through the process with you or very close to it, um, being the one that teaches you how to grow and develop on your own um, is one that we thought was novel and um, shows a lot of early promise that we hope to further explore um, in larger scale studies and in, in you know, various other uh, venues going forward. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Ant Antonis, can I ask you to, to comment um, as the director of the Mental Health Foundation on, on what you've heard from Mark, but also what, what is happening from your perspective, from your charity's perspective in terms of helping health professionals in the UK? Well, that was really interesting, Mark. Thank you. And I think what, what Mark beautifully described um, is, as far as I'm concerned, you know, reflects our evidence and knowledge of the key components of interventions that work in that kind of preventative, positive mental health space. Um, they have to harness human connection, uh, which I think was quite prominent in, in what Mark was describing. Um, they have to work for people's contexts and circumstances. Um, uh, and I think largely in many, in many ways and the discussion around mentoring was interesting as well. Uh, in my experience, mentoring programs often fail because they are there, there's not a culture change supporting them. It's just a demand on people's time. It become, they become a demand on people's time if there's no real structure and, and motivation behind them. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and, and third, it sort of has to follow some of that evidence, you know, of, of reducing stress, of preventing 
um, uh, illness and, and also preventing that isolation because I think our, our brain really processes and experiences in a different way in isolation compared to um, you know when, when we do that in, in connection with um, others. Um, the, the one thing I would add, I think, and I don't want to have a, a discussion of burnout go without mentioning that, is the, the something to be said about sleep. <laughs> uh, and I know, generally speaking, um, we tend, it's a, it's a topic we tend to underestimate, um, especially in postgraduate medicine, there, there are huge pressures and, and sometimes um, sleep is actually um, deprioritized um, by many. Um, but as far as I know from the evidence I'm reading and seeing and from, from speaking to different people, it, it seems that uh, in many ways, sometimes it's the missing link in terms of how we manage stress and, and build resilience. And um, uh, there, there is a lot of emerging research in helping us understand sleep a little bit better um, and um, actually giving it a position either within interventions or within culture programs or within change programs, um, giving it a, a position in stress reduction and prevention um, at an organizational level as well. Uh, Antonis, thank you very much indeed. We're coming to the end of our, our session. Are there any brief comments from our panel or from delegates about others who are on the call? either on Mark's presentation or other things we've heard in the hour. Caroline? I'd just like to say that Mark's work reinforces something that I've thought about for a long time, in that I think that the way that reflective practice, which is a key component of all healthcare professional development, the way that it's implemented is it's seen as an individual, too often it's seen as an individual task. And I don't think that uh, Donald, if you go back to the Donald Sean who first did the work, I don't think he was particularly saying that. And, and it can be so much richer if rather than it being, it starts with the individual, but it's then shared. And so I think that that's a really, it's really good to see those sorts of programs starting. Thank you, Caroline. A brief comment by Claire Wilmot. Sorry. When I was uh, at the Bristol Royal Infirmary in 19, whatever it was, 75, um, one of the wonderful things was lunch and dinner, <laughs> where we were all provided a good meal. Um, everybody knew that that was the time to break and to go and talk. Um, and I just think that that has gone. Well, I don't know if it's gone everywhere, but we had a place called the, in French a Hospital. We had a postgraduate place where, you know, we would rub shoulders with the, the mighty. <laughs> And we ate dinner with them. We ate lunch with them. And I think food and, and just good, good social sessions um, brings a lot of comfort. You know, you can just say to somebody who's, you know, I, I mean, Celestin, Mr. Celestin was one of the people I had lunch with many times uh, on the French A um, thing. And, you know, asking him about why did you invent the Celestin tube, which I'm sure most of you have forgotten if you ever heard of it. Um, and, you know, just hearing his perspective, he came from Mauritius and, you know, he had a very different idea of life. You know, Mr. I don't remember ever having lunch with Mr. Belsey, although he was, he was on the faculty, but I just remember the, the lunches, the food and the fellowship was wonderful and dinner at night. I mean, everybody had a beer, but that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> thank, on, you, on a specific, thank you very much, Claire. On a specific, I think what you're saying is, I suppose it, in the jargon, the, the firm used to be quite strong. There used to be a team and, and the better ones would, would uh, the seniors would, would look after the juniors and there'd be some social activity going on. The question is how on earth you manage to keep that going in modern times with shift systems and hours and so on. But I think in my view, I agree with you, it's, it's a loss not having that kind of support for many reasons. Uh, John, did you want to, would you have a question? Yes, thank you. I, I wanted to take this back even further than 1972. I mean, Mark referred to Barlin groups, which was started in the 1950s at the Tavistock Clinic, but they themselves succeeded work that Wilfred Bion and others had done with um, uh, soldiers who'd been through post-traumatic stress disorder and that in turn was influenced by work that the Quakers have done actually since the 18th century and what they used to call clearness committees 
um, that discuss these problems pretty much in the way that Schwartz fans do now. So I think what we were talking about is really a, a pretty eternal and universal human need to have this group support, um, both emotionally and in terms of, of cognitive learning. We are now at the end of our webinar. Many thanks to my co-organizers, Dr. John Lohner and Professor Bernard Chung. I'm also grateful to our panelists, Dr. Caroline Elton and Dr. Antonis Gazoulis, as well as all our presenters and our audience for joining us from around the world. Our next webinar will be on Monday the 24th of August on links between COVID-19 and neuropsychiatric disease led by FPM Fellow and researcher at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London, Dr. Tim Nicholson. You can find out more about these webinars, which are free and every month, on our website, thefpm.org.uk.